17. Uh, so we've had uh, the boys team existed two years prior to that. So they're 13th here. Yeah. Okay. And how far have you guys gotten in competition? The girls went to state last year. So that was their goal was to make it to state because they almost made it. They made it by, missed it by one the year before. And so that was their goal. Their big goal last year was to make it to state and they did. So. So is it a cumulative uh, point system? I mean, do you, um, like in car racing, you know, when you get points over the whole it's, season or? It's kind of complex. Uh -huh, so that's what I've you heard. get one regional and it's how you place there, but it's all, you also get points for like the uh, number of students that are on the academic uh, Dean's List and, and the awards. We applied for the Impact Award last year um, and any other awards. So that it all, it's like one big whole picture. So it isn't just strictly based on the competition that's going on on the field. Because robotics is more than just that. There's so many other things that are going into it. So, so. talk about that for a second. What, <laughs> what is, what is the, the, what kind of, of STEM experience are these kids getting out of it? Where do you see them going? How do you see them succeeding or not succeeding because of the robotics uh, position? Well, the STEM is almost the most obvious piece because it's, you know, it's the robotics, it's the um, hydraulics, it's, or not hydraulics, the pneumatics and the electronics and the programming and the coding and the building and the machining and, and the CNC and all that. So that, that's kind of like obvious and that's what people think of. But first robotics also involves like development of the human person. So our kids are out there doing public speaking, they're doing fundraising, they're working with kids of younger ages, trying to recruit them into, you know, junior Lego league and ultimately, you know, up into ours. They're speaking to, uh, last weekend we were at the Ely Film Festival because our girls were featured in a documentary that was accepted at the Ely Film Festival. It's called ba uh, Brains, Braids and Bots. And if you go to the NMRC website, or or you can go to YouTube and type in Brains, Braids and Bots. And it's a wonderful documentary. We had a, a, a professional team follow the girls for a full year. And so you, you really got to get the whole experience of, you know, how they grew as human, you know, and, and, and the other things. Um, so they're doing the speaking, they're, they're gaining those, uh, those skills, they're gaining that self confidence because they're going out there in public, doing the public speaking. And then they're also, because a lot of the awards that they write, they have to be written first. So before they actually do the presentation, so uh, it's project management because those have different timelines for when things are due, so they have to learn that. Those are definitely lifelong skills, and they're doing the writing, and then they ultimately do the presentation to the judges on top of that. So um, those are all those other things that ro uh, robotics brings to really help them grow up and, and give them life skills beyond. Even if they don't go into robotics, those are still life skills that they're going to use. So it's more of a team aspect than the robotics itself yeah. that you guys are building on. Yeah, that's the flashy stuff, but there's all this other great stuff that's going on that they don't even realize that you know how much they how much they've grown. So. A foundation forged in their grandfather's shop. Matt and Mike Martins know firsthand the value of quality machinery. At Martins Welding and Machine, they rely on three generations of knowledge and expertise in creating quality products for farmers, ranchers, residents, and businesses across North Dakota and beyond. To browse their full selection of bin caps, bale feeders, rock lifts, disc attachments, and more, visit martinswelding.com. Also ask about their garage doors. Martins Welding and Machine. Matt and Mike will make it right. This is Chris from RDK Enterprises, your local precision planting dealer. Manage what you can to overcome what you cannot. Farming is all about preparing your operation to be successful when given an opportunity. 
Invest a few minutes and bring in your seed meters to be reconditioned and calibrated. We have some room, so give us a call and we can help you overcome those simple obstacles. RDK Enterprises, 636-2119 or planterdoc.com. Gordon Construction of Monoman is a Native American-owned business proudly operating on the White Earth Indian Reservation since 1983. As a bonded general contractor, Gordon Construction provides years of experience in large, detailed, and within-budget projects. Gordon Construction is committed to the safety of its employees and the environment of its work sites. To learn more about Gordon Construction of Monoman, visit gcmonoman.com or call 218-935-2191. since 2016 actually earlier than that 2012 yeah. um, and I volunteer as a robotics referee I am graduate mechanical engineer I um, and I just came here from Fargo just to be able to help out and see how the game is going okay so tell me since you've been involved with it since 2012 yep. I, I imagine you were pretty pretty little then yeah uh, during high school that's when I was like for four years in the high school team of team 2181 Nice. And then um, in college did the RI3D, which is the robot in three days. We, I was the guy that was mainly recording and actually doing the footage of it too there, but it was cool being with NDSU to tackle it and then be able to like uh, bring it on video and show uh, new students like, hey, here's some ideas, try this out, try that out. Um, yeah. yeah. And then been volunteering as a referee for the last like four years now, I believe. Okay, so how many how many of these do you end up going to, and and how many, um, many. schools are you involved with over a year? Uh, I basically jump around. So this last year, I had a total of ten events that I went to. So it was uh, this is the first time going to a week zero event for me. But typically, I go to Grand Forks, Duluth, and Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. This year, I'll be at St. Cloud. But then uh, I'm also going to Houston, Texas, where they're going to be doing the championship. That one I will, will be doing some like just filling in anywhere I can with field reset and everything else. Um, and then they do a bunch of off season events. So I did off season and there's a list. Lacrosse, um, I, I'm not gonna be able to remember the full list, but there there was about six events that I did that, that were off this season. Okay, so you're a, you're a referee for this. Tell me what that entails. Tell me what you're looking for and and what, uh, what you basing your decisions and stuff on. Tell me about the mechanics of the, of yeah. the competition. Yep, so as a referee, of once the game comes out, I'm reading through the game manual and looking at what the fouls, penalties, or anything else going on. And then uh, I, we've got a referee team of uh, four to five people and following our head ref. And we're going through making calls of uh, yeah, making sure the game is fair and consistent for everyone. That's uh, the purpose of that. Can you explain the, the point system for this year's game? Yes, I would almost have to pull up a guide just to be able to remember it all, but it is... Uh, just an overview. Yeah, a quick overview of it is that they're taking the notes and um, placing them either in the speaker, which is that upper head shooting place, and then the amp, which is on the side. And then if they place two in the amp on the side, they can have a human player go and hit the button. We didn't really see that at all today, but if they do so, then any points scored in the upper speaker is actually worth more for that time. And then towards the end of the match, there's the last 20 seconds of the match that they have a chance of like an end game where they can choose to climb up. And then there's also this uh, little trap that not many teams did today or any at all, that they can then also put a, um, another note in there as well. Um, also missing that there's a high note that the human players after that the last 20 seconds they have the chance to throw that and if they get it onto the speaker I believe they get points and then if it's above one of the robots as well that is uh, additional points as well. So what did the competition look like today? Was it, was it uh, competitive? I mean were people, were the, were the teams really, um, I don't even know how, what, I'm, what yeah. I'm asking here. But um, the, it looked like the teams were progressing very well. Um, there, there was definitely, you can tell, some teams that were still needing to do more. There wasn't much going with autonomous, but it's pretty early on in the season still. It's week zero. 
by the time they may get to the actual regional, they might get their last little bits of autonomous or like anything else they figured out. Um, we, we didn't see much of autonomous, and that's the like first 20 seconds or 15 seconds of a match that if they even just drive and cross the line, they get points. It's, so that, it's simple, but uh, we haven't gotten too much of that yet. So. Uh, okay. I don't even know where I'm going. Oh, I asked her um, if there was a place that um, outside of school or outside of, you know, when they're adults or when they're young adults or, or whatever, is there a place they can go with with this kind of skill set, the, the robots, yes. basically? So, uh, F so the FRC sets them up for just an amazing setup of just life because once you graduate from high school, you have college where there's robotics clubs at almost every single college. There are the like RI3D and the opportunity to volunteer like I have, but then there is also like autonomous snow plow and complete, a bunch of other different competitions. Um, and then even after that, I, I went in for as mechanical engineering when graduating at NDSU in 2020, and then I now work at uh, a company that makes machines that package medical supplies. It, it set me up for a passion and kept me going. Oh, you did What we do mainly is build the everybody. Okay. Because especially since we have a first year team, it's the best way for them to get their feet wet. Tell me about your bot. Tell me. Okay, that's our bot right there. If you want to get a shot of it real quick. <laughs> so that is called the Every Bot. Uh, if you'll notice, there's a lifting device on it, mm -hmm. so we can get on the chain and pull ourselves up. Uh, we have what we call the claw, where we can put a, a note in there and then put it in the amp. So we can drop it in there and there's a belt pulley system on there where we can pull it in and shoot it out. And we're also able to, once we go to the heat station, they can drop a note in there and then we can shoot it into the pool. Um, my, my boots going to I'm so sorry. So, uh, the kids, what what kids are involved there? You said they're like a fresh team. Anywhere from 9 through 12. Okay. And what we have, uh, we also have junior robots okay. down the grade level. So nice. we're kind of trying to feed them into us, our, our senior program, which is nice. Right. Um, we are going to Grand Forks this year, and then we're going to Las Vegas. <laughs> we had a very large grant from Apple. But yeah, so. But they're going to fly them down there, and I'll be driving the robot with the equipment down there. That is very cool. So, um, how many kids are involved in your program? Well, 12 right now. We kind of have some that don't come all the time. Sure. They come when they can. Sure. So, are they all getting something really cool out of this? Do you think they're... I think they're... Learning troubleshooting. They're learning how to wire. They're learning how to use various tools. Work with metal. Yeah. yeah. So, as the kids uh, going through the the program, are they going on to college and and stuff, or are they going out we in the have, workforce and getting some? We have pieces? some that plan to go on to college. Some that don't. Uh, last year, we went out to Asus in Palm Springs. Right. And we had a number of kids that went out and interviewed at the colleges and you know, made connections that sure. way. So sure. One from another team that was hired by one of the alphabet agencies. So. Nice. Yeah. And so the kids are using what they're learning. Yes. You know, no matter where they're going, right? Right. No and the, a lot of the companies, they like to see kids that are in robotics. Right. Because they learn how to troubleshoot already, they learn critical thinking. Right. And learning the CAD and learning the... Do you guys use CAD to design your programs? Uh, no. Okay, tell me, because the other teams do. So well, The other teams do, like yeah. I said, we build the everybody. So we are so trying to get into CAD. Okay. So we can teach the kids. We have a 3D printer. Okay. And we have a water router, I believe. So once we get that going, we can start building our own parts. So have you used, have you used, have you built um, bots in previous years that are a little more, uh, that are different than the every bot? Or? Yeah. Um, 
some of the robots. The first one we built, it was very basic, and it would pick up a hands and then put it on the spaceship or the cargo ship. Or drop it into a cargo bin. We uh, had one where it would shoot it into a central bin. We could pick it up off the floor, or pick it up from the human station, and shoot it into a central bin. We play defense. Uh, we have a point in this mode. So the first 15, 30 seconds of the match, it'll do what we program it to do. Uh, the last time, basically, they had. Uh, portals that you drop a cone on, or platforms you drop a cube on. So what it would do is, we would uh, program it to just drop a cone on one of the portals, or drop a cube on one of the platforms high over and that's what we did for autonomous. Then we had to move back out of the out of the area. Engineering, architecture, land surveying, environmental services we have the experience to tackle all manner of projects. Widseth is known as a firm that is solid, agile, and versatile. And that's the kind of reliability you can expect when you engage us on your project. They are invested in our community. They are invested with our people. They're gonna create a product that's gonna exceed our expectations every single time. That is why we go with Widseth. At Enbridge, we believe sustainability is the foundation of our success. How well we perform as a steward of our environment, a safe operator of essential energy infrastructure, a good neighbor, and a diverse employer defines our success. Learn more about Enbridge's environmental, social, and governance commitments and our Indigenous Reconciliation Plan at Enbridge.com. Welcome back to the Your Live Event Robotics Show. I'm Jack. I'm here with uh, Doug Frisk. He is the chair for the Duluth uh, Regional Event. Uh, first and foremost, how are you doing today? It's been a long day. Uh, <laughs> one of my other robotics things I do is we run the practice field up here. So we just set the practice field up in one of the high schools so that the teams can work on the field before the event. Oh, okay. So... You see, that's always been so interesting when it comes to, you know, talking with the kids and like seeing how they practice. Like one of my big questions are, how do you guys practice? So you guys actually just create like a little arena for them to come and practice at as well? Or is this just for pre um, what what is going to be the double decker this week? So we created a, a organization uh, back in 2019 now. Uh, the goal was to provide uh, practice capabilities for all of the teams up in Northeast Minnesota. So we have uh, 20 teams this year. And you've seen the event, right? Um, yeah, no, we've seen the, uh, obviously we haven't seen this year's event, but we, we've seen uh, last two years events, yes. But you've seen what the field looks like. Yes. You know, it's, 80 by 30 feet and uh, weighs about 6,000 pounds. Uh, so we, well, you know, 6,500. Uh, we truck that to uh, various high schools every weekend and then set it up and then teams come in and practice. And so this weekend is our biggest event. We're going to have 12 or 13 regional teams coming in to use the field prior to their competition next week. Okay. No, that's... That's crazy. I didn't even, again, it's one of those things I've always, I'm always so interested in how you guys practice, but that's, that, that makes a lot of sense with how you do it. No, perfect. Um, but with, with that being said, a little, little extra nugget of information I wasn't uh, ready for. That's awesome. But um, <clears throat> let's actually talk about uh, the Duluth double decker um, coming up. Uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand, but um, <clears throat> you have uh, 112 different teams coming 
110. Uh, two regional events, 55 teams per event. Okay. So, I, I mean, that's, that's, that's massive. So, do you guys have two fields set up, or is it just going to be one field and it's just going to be blank oh. amount of days going forward? We use the hockey arena, and we have two fields set up, one on the one side of the field, one on the other side of the field. And so we have the, both fields running uh, concurrently uh, all day long, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday next week. I know. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, <clears throat> how long... Um... How long has the uh, Duluth Double Decker been been going for? The Double Decker, uh, the second regional event happened around 2014. Uh, I believe that's the correct date. Uh, the Lake Superior Regional was held here prior to that in uh, for a few years. Um, so yeah, we've been going on for a little over a decade now. That's awesome. Now, was. <laughs> Was the idea because of the venue? Was it always going to be like, oh, it's, this is going to be a very large thing, or was it, did it just grow into a very large event? I I think it grew into a large event. Uh, about eight year, ten year, eight years ago in Minnesota, the number of teams just exploded. Uh, we went from you know about fifty teams to at one point we had darn close to two hundred and fifty teams in Minnesota. Uh, COVID knocked that down a bit, but uh, we're gaining some of those teams back. Uh, so they needed another event. And the facility that we're running in, the Deck Convention Center here in Duluth, actually has enough room for pits for all the robots, for a practice field. Uh, the Air Force is setting up one of their demos uh, at the event, and then the two fields. So it's a fairly large event. It is the largest FRC event under one roof that isn't a championship event. Uh, the Michigan State Championship and the Texas Championship are larger. Uh, but this is right up there with uh, the biggest events that they may do. Okay, that's that's nuts because after like okay, so you have two you have two uh, main fields going at the same time. You also like you just said you have a practice field as well, and then you have other things coming in and. Doing yeah, that's crazy because we've been to um um uh, <clears throat> oh sure what's the uh Grand Forks uh Lara Thank Center? you, thank you. We've been to Grand Forks and everything, and I thought that was a giant like place to go put it in, but this sounds this sounds huge. <laughs> it, it it's pretty impressive to see. Okay, and so it, uh, it's pretty loud in there. <laughs> uh, that that's one thing I've noticed. A lot of uh, and it's it's good loud. It isn't just random loud, but like it does seem like when it comes to um, throwing an event, it seems like the robotics really do kind of like they make it kind of almost a rock concert for nerds. That's the that's the uh, oh, term okay. I've heard. <laughs> that is a good way to put it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. Now, um, real quick, how how did you get involved? Like. Uh, where, where did you first hear about the robotics or, or how did you get involved with this? So uh, the high school that my children went to uh, started a robotics team uh, 20, 2009, I believe it was. And they, uh, my son uh, joined the robotics team a few years later. And then my daughter went through the robotics team. So I had eight years of uh, children on the robotics team. And looking at what FIRST does for the students, I was really impressed and uh, just couldn't help but think that my life had first existed when I was in high school so many decades ago. Um, my, my life might have been considerably different. Uh, and so I just really became dedicated to making sure that this is available and that's that's outstanding and it it is awesome to this is this is interesting because typically i always talk with uh people that oh you know i i did it in high school all the way through and i came back what was it I, we talked a little bit beforehand where like i was first introduced i'm from cleveland so like robotics just 
I didn't even know that this was a thing when people were talking about it. I was like, oh, you mean like battle bots? Like everybody does, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> but no, two years ago, when starting to kind of get into and, you know, broadcasting for, for this, I, the same exact thing. That was the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, where was this? When I was like, when I was in high school, this is so cool. But it, not only that, it, it is such an interesting thing to see what this does outside of like, okay, we see the game. The game is such a small part of it, but everything else around it is so awesome. The, the development that you see in the students as they're building the robot, because they have to run a business, they have to design the robot, they have to learn to manage a project on a very large scale with a very small budget and a very small amount of time. And to see the students successfully do that, they really have to step up their, their game. And it's it's an incredible opportunity for these students to see what you know, STEM can do for them and to prepare them for sort of modern business. Uh, the, the kids that are coming out of this program are absolutely, the students that are coming out of this program, I shouldn't say kids, <laughs> are absolutely the, the employees of the future for a lot of companies out there. I... Not not to cut you off, but like everything you just said there, I a I haven't heard somebody, and it's so true. The instant you said it, I was like, oh, that is exactly what it is. It, like yes, there's so much team building and everything else in this, but you're they are running a small little business. It is so amazing. And then what you just got done saying there, the, these are the employer, the employees of the future. It's. A hundred percent. Not to be like, whoa, you just blew my mind there, but whoa, you just kind of blew my mind with so <laughs> with like, yes, that's a hundred percent correct. A hundred percent correct. But um <clears throat> now so your kids graduated, everything else, you you stuck with it. The are the kids are your kids still? Uh, involved with it? They are still participating. Both of them are now mentoring on the team that they uh, played on. Uh, it's the 2512, the Duluth East Daredevils. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I mentored that team for a couple of years, but I'm, I've moved off to other things now. Okay. So I have you... 20 teams now. <laughs> okay. That's, that's awesome. Um, now, you know, going from parent to participant, I mean, how did you how did you take that step? Was it something as easy as, hey, I just talked with the school and they were like, yeah, come on in. Uh, oh, going from parent to mentor? Yes. Uh, so uh, my son went through all four years and then uh, about the second year that my daughter was in, I, I became a mentor for their team. Um. It's not always best to have a parent uh, of an active student as a mentor. It can be a, a difficult. Uh, it can be difficult to navigate some of the you know personal issues. Right. Um, so I, I'm not a big necessarily fan of it. Uh, it worked out okay in our case. But uh, uh, yeah, that's I became a mentor, and then about 2019, I started this other organization that is so, sort of supporting all of the teams in Northeast Minnesota. Okay. Um, now that other, the, the organization you, you, uh, you created, if you don't mind going a little bit into that, that'd be great. Uh, well, the Arrowhead Robotics Coalition, uh, okay. is, was created in 2019. And our goal is to make all of the teams in Northeastern Minnesota or anywhere really, uh, more sustainable and ideally more competitive. Uh, the practice field is our big thing. So we have a full-size practice field. We try and make it as close to the actual field as possible. And then the teams can come in and practice it, uh, practice on it. We run it in uh, multiple locations each year. So this year the uh, field started in Duluth and then it was in Silver Bay up the North Shore. 
Uh, then it was in Hermantown, a little bit north of Duluth, then Grand Rapids last week. And this week, it's a little south of Duluth and Esco. So we moved the field around, we set it up in different locations. And that allows the teams, because we represent essentially a quarter of the state physically. Uh, you know, we go from Grand Marais to, well, I don't want to go there. Uh, so we physically, it's about a quarter of the state. And the teams are fairly geographically dispersed. Uh, for, you know, in the metro area, it, you might have a team that's 10 minutes away. Here, your nearest uh, partner team or neighbor team might be 75 miles away. Uh, so we try and move the field around so that everybody has an opportunity to use the field. Uh, and everybody has an opportunity to practice. It seems to be working well, uh, but it does require an incredible time commitment. I, I bet. Now, so... Because every single year it's a, it's a new it's a new game. So every single year you guys are building a new yes new field. So I mean, are you are you guys figuring out what the game is the same time as everybody else, or are you like, oh, you know what, we're peeking in maybe a little early on it? So we no, I, I would love to be able to peek in a little bit early, but we we see the reveal at the same time as the teams do. And then we uh, start by uh, downloading the complete field build plans. First has complete drawings for all of the actual field elements. Um, they have wooden field elements for the teams to practice on, which are sort of simulations of the actual field. Uh, we take the actual field drawings and then we try to look at them to make elements that will be uh, wherever the robot's interacting with them. It's the same material, same dimensions, so that if it, uh, you know, if the note hits the speaker on our field and uh, scores correctly, it should score correctly on the real field. Okay. That's our goal. So, so you, wow, you guys are are basically reverse engineering from just a picture or something. Wow. Well, it's not it's not a picture. It's a 180 page detailed document with. Uh, uh, so I have all of the dimensions for everything. But uh, oh. it does take a bit of time because fir first goal is, of course, that they're building a field that's uh, very strong and can be moved from week to week to uh, all of these events where they're going to play 90 or 100 matches on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, my field doesn't need to be quite so strong. So we tend to use uh, corrugated plastic instead of polycarbonate where we can. It's a quarter of the weight and a tenth the price. Uh, so it's advantageous for us to use that where the robot's not going to crash into it. Right. Uh, but wherever a robot's going to hit the field, it has to be strong enough to stop that robot moving at 30 miles an hour. Okay. Um, wherever you're going to try and score, uh, the dimensions have to be the same. So uh, we have the full stages this year. I don't know if you've seen this year's field. Yeah, no, uh, Crescendo, right? It has the... Yes, crescendo. Yeah, the center stage, it has the uh, amp, and then the I forget what they call the side. Uh, the source, the speaker, and the stage. The source, the speaker, and the stage, yes. So, so okay. It, what, what do you think of this year's, like, game and the game pieces? Oh, the game pieces are awfully fragile. Mm -hmm. Um. So it's going to be interesting to see how well they survive at the actual competition. Uh, we we ordered 48 uh, on January 6th, and they finally arrived. The la they, they shipped half of them to us, but then they ran out. So we got the second half of the shipment last week. Okay. Uh, but we've uh, suffered some uh, casualties of our game pieces. Okay. Uh, it is a very interesting game piece. Uh, it's a ring, uh, essentially, a foam ring. So kind of like a 14-inch diameter Nerf, uh, not quite Frisbee. Right. Um, we have a team uh, that's shooting them so hard that they're actually uh, pushing things around on our field. We've had to reinforce some things. <laughs> um it's uh it's it's pretty impressive to watch them because they will line up from half the field away and just pound rings into the uh speaker 
and they'll hit the inside of it. And each time our, our speaker was shifting over about a quarter inch. So, it, and it, like you said, you're using a little bit lighter material and everything else. I mean, is that something where it's like, yeah, no, whatever they're shooting, it's going to cause problems with, you know, the big stuff? Or is it more like, oh, yeah, no, we were maybe a little light on some stuff? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were a little bit light uh, in building the speaker initially. It's oh. been reinforced uh, since then. Oh, um, it's much more solid than it was the first time we had it up and we had uh, teams playing against it. But uh, again, going into our philosophy of we want it to be as close to the field as possible. Um, rather than an inch and a quarter square aluminum tube, we're using essentially plywood and two by twos. Right. except where the ring hits the inside of the speaker and there it's the same hdpe plastic that's on the real field oh, okay so when the uh, sorry about my dog no you're uh, completely fine there are deer in the yard uh, uh when the ring hits the inside of the speaker it should behave the same as it does on the actual field that's our goal okay no awesome no kind of getting back to which uh, hey that that's that's so the, the practice uh, supplying the practice field is so awesome but getting back to uh okay. yeah. yeah the the event um <clears throat> anything with with the field with all that i mean hey it sounds like it's a ginormous uh, it's a ginormous venue uh Anything that you're seeing that might actually maybe when it comes to this field compared to any other field in that event center, is, is there anything that might be a little weird or interesting to kind of set up or is it all going to be pretty, yeah, it's going to be normal? I've, I've set up the uh, Northern Lights and Lakes Courier field many, many years. I'm hoping for a not interesting uh, setup this year. <laughs> uh, we have had issues where first just didn't ship some of the parts of the field. Oh. And it's a it's an issue with week one events because you know sometimes stuff doesn't make it. Right. Uh, in fact, last year, uh, oddly enough, a whole side border was missing. Um, so they ended up pulling the side border off the practice field and bringing it over to the uh, actual field. Okay. And kind of uh, making it fit. Okay. Now <clears throat> This being a week one event, I mean, what was it? Majority of the majority of week zeros were the last like two weeks, I believe. Yes. Um, <clears throat> how, when the teams get there, when the students get there, how does it take, in your eyes, do you think it takes like the students or the teams to kind of like get into the groove of things or are they like just boom, they're ready to go? Generally speaking, the students are, are ready to go. Uh, we'll have load in next Wednesday night, and hopefully we won't have too much snow. And uh, we'll bring all the teams in. Uh, they'll all go out their pits, get set up. <clears throat> and then Thursday morning, they'll start uh, having the robots inspected and uh, practicing. Now, you you mentioned the pits a little bit earlier as well, but I... That's that's one of the places I like. I love just watching what's going on in the pits and everything like that. Um, having a hundred ten different pits going on at the same time and two fields firing off. Um, how difficult is it to set that like section of it, the event up? I believe we have six volunteers dedicated just to keeping traffic flow correct. Um, and working. So we have people with, uh, you know, handheld stop signs, making sure the robots can pass and the spectators can pass when they need to and uh, nobody collides. It is it is a uh, very uh, large logistical challenge requires a lot of volunteers. No, that's 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 interesting. You 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 you'll have six uh, traffic <laughs> volunteers. Yes, traffic cops. Yes. Yes, that's that's very that's that's very unique. It is, it is. <laughs> I, I've and, not seen that yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. 
just uh, you know unique odd things we have uh, a uh, volunteer who is kind of our unofficial uh, crockpot cop uh, we have teams that will go out in into the arena find an outlet and set up a crockpot with you know food that they'll be cooking <clears throat> and the, uh, the venue does not like that happening so we actually have a volunteer that's going around asking them to not do that <laughs> So how this that is so interesting. So how long how long has has that been hap happening? Where like not just one team, obviously multiple teams have been bringing crockpots. Yeah, well, it's been going on for a few years. I understand. <laughs> that's that's in, that's that's really interesting. Now, um, it, it comes to the crowd and the fans. Uh, anything. I mean, it is it, like you said; it's the hockey arena, so it's just the hockey stands, and everything else is going around it. Or is there anything? Yeah. So the fans are all in the stands. Uh, typically, about three thousand people or more. Uh, so it's a pretty good sized crowd. That's a great. That's a great sized crowd. Um, <clears throat> I, I've also noticed so. It, Again, using the uh, lovingly using the term uh, a rock concert for nerds, um, you have a lot of you know the student fan sections are pretty crazy when it comes to these events. So, do you have them in their own section, or you just go, yeah, no, they can go wherever they need to go. The students can uh, when they go in, they can go wherever they need to go. We try and uh, have them not save spaces. Uh, that tends to lead to conflicts among teams. Oh, okay. You know, if you have uh, two students coming in the morning or four students coming in the morning and, and sort, of, sort of block off a box of 50 seats saying this is for our team, that, that, that tends to cause conflicts. We don't like conflicts. We want everyone to uh, get along nicely. No, no. A hundred percent agree there. The easier everybody is, the easier everything is going to go, for sure. Um. Now, before before I let you go, any last thoughts? Any last comments you want to make? Oh, I'm I'm very excited. I don't know if you know this, but this is my first year as uh, co-chair of the regional planning committee. Oh, okay. Um, a, a couple of friends of mine were co-chairs recently, but they had to step down. Uh, so they handed all of the documentation over to me, and we've been, uh, I've been trying to live up to their example since then. Okay. So, okay. well, okay, I lied. <laughs> and now I have a few more questions for you. No, I did not know this was your first time uh, as, as a co-chair. So how, uh, like you said, a few friends uh, mm -hmm. seem to kind of, uh, you know, step away, everything else. So how has the how has being the chair for not just it's your first it's your first time being a chair and it's a week one event how how has that been that's insane it's it's been scary <laughs> uh, the problem is I don't know what I don't know and <laughs> I know there are things that I'm missing but I will figure them out as we uh, go along I there's uh, the group from first and the group from uh, the event planning company, they've all done this before. They have all of their stuff. I have all of the plans for what we're supposed to do, and hopefully it'll all go uh, go together well. I mean, one of the things that I'm supposed to be doing that I am uh, actually terribly failing at right now is doing more media here in northeastern Minnesota. Uh, and I should get on that, actually. <laughs> well, no, you are definitely not doing terrible. This this has been fantastic. Uh, I really enjoyed enjoyed our conversation. This has been great. But no, so okay, that is that is that is so interesting. So was this something that your friend said, "Hey, we think you should do this," or is this something that you were like, "Yeah, give me this. Let's let's go." So the previous uh, co chairs, uh, right. Bruce and Stephanie Farringer. 
Uh, Stephanie had some health issues, and unfortunately, she passed away from cancer earlier this year. Uh, so they kind of knew last summer they had to step down. And so she did as much as she could to try and prepare and, and make the transition as easy as possible for me. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm working from somebody else's notes and, uh, it's, it's been an interesting, uh, experience. So we have, uh, one of the other co-chairs is the, uh, planning committee chair from one of the Minneapolis events. And, uh, the, the, yeah, another co-chair is, uh, a local parent as well, um, so we, we have we have a group that's doing it. Uh, a lot of the local uh, aspects are falling on me. Okay. No. Well, I, hey, I, I, when it comes to the media stuff, I think you you hit it out of the park. At least with me here, this has been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> real quick, if you don't mind, just telling everybody when. Uh, you know, uh, when do the doors open for this event for the public? So um, the all of the full documentation is on the website, frcnorthland.org, uh, which is the same as for the uh, Grand Forks event. Uh, the doors open Thursday next week, uh, the 29th, I believe. Yes. Uh, Thursday, the 29th, uh, about 8.30 a.m. to the public. That's the practice day. Uh, it's a good day to go and sort of talk to the teams in a when they're in a less stressed environment. Uh, Friday are all qualification matches that'll run from about well, opening ceremonies will start at eight thirty. The first match should start at eight fifty five, and it'll run till uh, five or six o'clock. Um, then uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, we have more qualification matches. Saturday afternoon, we have the playoff matches. Um, it's not a good time to visit with the students during the playoff matches. They are very busy at that point. Oh, 100%, 100%. Yes. No, I, I've, I've learned that quite, quite quickly, uh, when it comes to interviews, they'll, they'll give the interviews, but it's very much like, all right, we're here for like two minutes. What's up? <laughs> but no. it is, yeah, the event is, uh, as all first events are free and open wow. to the public. Uh, wow. we, we do have the issue with the uh, wow. the deck does charge ten dollars for parking. Uh -huh. So if you want free parking, you have to walk a bit. <laughs> Again, hopefully it does not snow. <laughs> oh, last year we had a blizzard and we had a couple of teams trailers ended up in the ditch and uh, oh. we ended up sending some trucks down to help haul them out of the ditch. Oh, that's oh, that that's crazy. That's oh absolutely. yeah, well, and then their robot was damaged because their trailer flipped over in the ditch. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I was like, so even when they got there, it's not like they they probably had another hour or two hours of just fixing the damage of the. Uh, yeah, no, hope hopefully, hopefully the weather is still as kind as it has been at least for here for us. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Doug, seriously, thank you so much uh, for taking time and uh, and talking with me this has been awesome i'm happy to thank you thank you and, so uh, much uh if you want to come down come on down next week uh i can give you a tour oh you you know what we'll have i'll i'll see if i can make it happen i always love love uh going to uh go to these events so we'll see if we can make that happen for sure so uh doug seriously thank you so much uh for everyone else stay tuned